Hello, welcome to another F2 Pool Mining interview series. I'm joined by Daniel Johnson. Um, I'm my name is Daniel Huang. I'm special projects lead at F2 Pool. Um, but yeah, I let's let's get started. Um, Daniel, if you could quickly introduce yourself, um, the company you work at, and um, some of the interesting stuff that you've been working on in brief that we can go into a bit later. Yeah. Hi, Daniel. Thanks for uh, inviting me on. Um, yeah. So my name is Daniel Johnson. Uh, I am. Uh, I work within the mining industry here in 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 Iceland. I am the CEO of a company called uh, Green Blocks which is uh, our relatively new project, not our, our first project, but uh, this one is, is a, a new um, um, enterprise and, and brand, if we will, um, where we want to focus on, uh, on one side, uh, mining uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies here in Iceland. On, on renewable energy, hence the green part of our name. But we also want to uh, partner up with those that have excess energy. Um, it's most often uh, those producing power, but in some cases it can be large scale buyers of power who for some reason have excess energy. Uh, at any rate, we want to uh, partner up with parties uh, like those and uh, help them maximize the utilization of their power and it's it's a there's a there's a convergence there between these two industries that is uh, largely unexplored um, when we meet uh, those that are in the power production industry we uh, often get into conversations where you know th they're having a, a few uh, eureka moments when we're explaining how mining works and what it can do in terms of uh, optimizing uh, power grids and networks. Fantastic. Yeah, I'd love to kind of dive into some of the energy efficiency and, mm -hmm. and clean energy sourcing versus other sources of energy in terms of the Bitcoin mining space in a bit. But yeah, I, I guess we could start up start up with some some uh, some warm up talk topics, um, just like some some general information. I I think everyone always has like an origin story of well, how they got into crypto and Bitcoin. So yeah, if you can share a bit about how you started your career as a miner, what got you interested in cryptocurrency, what was the Bitcoin landscape like back then? Um, yeah, I think a lot of people would be interested to hear that. Sure. Um, as with as for, for for many, it's you know it's not a it's not a linear uh, path uh, you know to to where I wound up uh, today necessarily. But um, so my background is in IT. Uh, been an IT specialist for a long time. I mean, I started working in in two thousand two here in Iceland, and you know lived abroad for a while uh, in France and Ireland. Um, in roles like, you know, I was a senior server analyst for Dell for a few years in Ireland and, and so on. Uh, came back here to Iceland and, and, and wound up in uh, 2016. I was working at a company. <clears throat> I kind of pivoted a bit into uh, more on the business side, uh, sales and so on, and kind of capitalizing on my technical experience. And um, so I was working for the biggest, uh, IT services provider here in Iceland. And these guys had a sister company at the time, which was a data center. And, uh, and uh, I had access to, uh, like within my role, uh, I had access to a mailbox that um, was just flooded with inbound requests from people trying to place mining equipment. And, uh, and this is, you know, I had obviously, I'd heard about Bitcoin, but I had never uh, dove in. It, it, it's, you know, in hindsight, I feel it's a bit weird that, you know, it was so close. And a couple of times, you know, I read a little bit about it, but it was just kind of like the time, it just never happened that I actually dove in and, and went down the rabbit hole. But at this point, I'm, 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 I'm seeing this massive request for space in an Icelandic data center purely for mining equipment. And it kind of made me think, you know, it kind of made me go, huh, you know, this is a massively growing industry, it would seem. Like, you know, this is, 
um, th this is this is scaling rapidly apparently. And th and at that point, the the that data center had been scaling fairly rapidly up uh, on the back of 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 mining. So um, that's the point at which I kind of take some time, start reading about mining, and I really got into crypto through mining. I mined my first Bitcoin. I, did, I didn't buy it. Um, so yeah, this is 2016, 27, or like to, end of 2016, early 2017. And um, I kind of, uh, I kind of just went in, uh, sorry about that. Uh, that's my, that's my dog um, opening, <laughs> opening the door to my office. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, so, so I started out, you know, I bought some equipment uh, with a couple of guys I I, I know and uh, kind of just started dabbling in this. But really, and as is with so many people who kind of get into this and, and start understanding, like, you know, once I understood proof of work and what this is and where it's coming from, I was just absolutely fascinated by the topic and and it captivated me, you know, uh, I, I guess I'm one of the people who has the, that type of head where, you know, if I find something and I find it super interesting, you know, uh, you know, uh, I, everything else kind of uh, fall, falls from the sides and, and I kind of hyper focus on that. Um, and that's what happened. I mean, for months, this is what, you know, sure, I was I was doing something else for a day job at that time, but but uh, this is what I was interested in. This is what I was thinking about, learning about this. How does it work? Uh, what are the dynamics of this industry and so on? And I uh, was lucky enough that a few months later, that data center was kind of officially split away from that IT services company. And as a part of that, um, the the, uh, uh, the 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 CEO of the data center, the guy who became the CEO of the data center, um, was building a team and, and offered me a place on that team. So I became the uh, director of blockchain technologies for this data center. Uh, stayed there for about uh, a year, and uh, end of 2018, the the great bear winter is kind of where our our our. Um, uh, we we split paths, and in the beginning of 2019, you know, I branched out on my own. Basically, we uh, raised uh, funds for a mining operation here in Iceland, which we then launched uh, mid 2019, and we've been running that since. And that has then now, you know, through a bit of a evolution, we we wind up. We still, you know, that's still ongoing. That project is still ongoing, and. And uh, and uh, yeah, today we're we're working on building up uh, this new brand of green blocks. Awesome! Yeah, I I also started my dive into the rabbit hole as a miner, um, <laughs> a Bitcoin and Dogecoin miner when Dogecoin had first come out. But that's oh, really that's cool. that's pretty that's pretty cool. Yeah, I I guess um, I I'd, I'd be super interested since you've been in and working in and around like the. The data center, the IT sector, and the Bitcoin sector in in Iceland. Can you tell us a little bit about like the Icelandic um, kind of regulatory environment, the policy environment? Like, is it is it uh, is it favorable, or does does kind of like the government in Iceland understand like crypto and, and mining, and um, are they are they pretty open to talking about? Um, how it should be kind of monitored or is it, is it not monitored strict or friendly? Yeah. I, I, I think that would be a fantastic, fascinating kind of um, to, to hear from you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I want to say the regulatory environment env environment here in Iceland isn't necessarily super clear in the sense that it's not as if, uh, we've taken a stance and this is how we will treat cryptocurrencies and so on. But there, as with every country, there are rules and regulations within which we must uh, operate. So, you know, ha dealing with uh, banks and funds and all that, you know, we all have to go through the same AML, KYC procedures and all of that. Um, we pay our, our, our taxes here in Iceland and, 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 and all of that. Um, I think that uh, in terms of being favorable towards the industry, um, it would be very hard for the, the government and the country of Iceland um, 
not to be favorable, uh, particularly since um, you know power grids are complicated. And uh, Iceland, we're an island in the middle of the northern Atlantic Ocean. Um, we have no connections to outside countries with regards to our power grid. So we're an absolutely isolated grid, which uh, makes us, I believe, the only uh, grid in the world that's running on 100% renewable energy. There is nothing else on our grid. It's about an 85-15 split of hydro versus geothermal. But um, um, so at, at some point, someone figured out that it, we could, in fact, export uh, energy and electricity by heavy industries. So the aluminium industry was the first target within that. And we have a few uh, aluminium smelters uh, here in Iceland. Uh, the big uh, companies like um, uh, Rio Tinto and Century Aluminium have uh, uh, facilities here in Iceland. And this was a way for us to capitalize on, on the natural resources that we wanted to capitalize on and, and essentially export uh, electricity and create jobs, uh, uh, further jobs out of that industry and so on. So, so that's great. But the, 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 the problem uh, when you're selling uh, large scale electricity to these heavy industry uh, uh, plants is they need guaranteed power. So an aluminum smelter that's drawing 400 megawatts needs those 400 megawatts absolutely guaranteed, which means there, there needs to be excess power on the grid that's ready for, you know, if, if, if there's any type of malfunction or anything comes up, there, there needs to be additional power ready. And um, essentially, th there was no large scale buyer willing or, or able to step into this environment and say, listen, I'm willing to buy power, I'm willing to buy 50 or 100 megawatts here and on the condition that you can cut the power off you know this is the the whole load balancing as we've seen uh discussed a lot in texas for example um you know the the just the concept of uh you can shut us off if, if there's a problem on the grid you can just turn us off if we're down for a day or two or three days, it's not the end of the world for us. While these heavy industries, they, they just can't do that. They'll have multi-million dollar damages if, if their power gets cut off. So all of a sudden, there's an industry that's willing to buy some of this excess energy that was an unsellable product previously. So, you know, all this to say, all of a sudden, a new industry has stepped in. It's an industry that's not polluting um it's it's running uh it's it's a large scale large scale con consumer of electricity and it's willing to buy a certain type of product of electricity which no one would buy previously so all of a sudden you know we are generating revenue uh from a resource that was generating zero revenue uh previously perhaps and i'm not saying 100% of the of the usage of uh electricity of data centers in Iceland is of this type of, of power, if you get what I mean. Um, we're certainly not only buying, you know, um, um, this, uh, this um, uh, what's the word in English, you know, un, 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 non-guaranteed power. Um, we're definitely also buying guaranteed power, but, uh, but there, it is a mix. And uh, so, yeah, so this and, and the fact that all of a sudden there's a data center industry in Iceland which is essentially the first competitor in terms of buying electricity from uh, the Icelandic market that is not a heavy industry, you know, that is, that is act essentially a green industry. So, so there's that factor as well. And, and so, you know, overall, I think it would be a very, very, you know, weird situation uh, if, if any, any regulatory changes would come out that would affect this industry negatively and uh, there's no special taxes on us there's no you know um you know there is vat and so on in iceland but if you're if you're operating within the brackets of that 
uh, which the the data center companies, for example, definitely are. Then you know this is this is these are refundable uh, charges and so on. So and in general, if you, you know if you are running a you know a branch here, uh, you you um, there's a twenty percent tax on on uh, corporate. Uh, corporate gains uh, or, or, you know, enterprise tax. Um, But in a lot of cases, and in most cases, the data center companies or the operating companies of the equipment are uh, in turn selling hash rates to a foreign entity. So, you know, you're not necessarily just running a pure Icelandic company uh, when you're running a mining operation in Iceland. It's usually a hybrid where you have an Icelandic branch and then you have a foreign uh, uh, parent company, if you will. Got it. Yeah, that's that. That is such fascinating clarity into to the thing. I, I think the efficiency concept that you mentioned with load balancing, which we we definitely have seen in Texas with like the heat when there's heat waves, everyone's running their AC, and then right these mining companies, as you mentioned, come in as kind of last last resort options for the the local governments to kind of rely on of like yeah we can turn it off and then that we can kind of solve a lot of problems for for people who need to have uh, electricity immediately. I think, I think it, it makes so much sense for local, you know, regulatory agencies or just those jurisdictions to kind of, right. Not demonize mining or, or, or crypto as it has been more adopted. And, um, I, and I think, especially in your case, um, because Iceland is, as you mentioned, 85% um, hydro, 15% geothermal, it's all clean. So <laughs> there, there's really no, there's no, um, nothing to be said. Yeah. And, and I guess regarding that point, because Iceland is completely uh, relying on renewable energy, we have definitely um, as the cryptocurrency ecosystem or the more particularly the, the proof of work ecosystem, right? A lot of people have um, criticized uh, the cryptocurrency ecosystem for using non-renewable energy um, and there obviously are quite a few um, takes on this issue uh, of Fort right? Some, some would be very, some are very adamantly against the whole ESG, you know, uh, concept of it being unfairly levied on cryptocurrency when there's a lot of other industries that are worse, like nine times worse, like, or, or more like, right, like the aerospace industry. And the type of value that it's um, that it produces. Obviously, the aerospace industry is immensely important to you know everyone. But uh, yeah. it's it's um, right. You, one could even say like a global financial system is just as important, if not more important, and and, and that. So, I, I I'd actually be curious as to like um, because Iceland is hundred percent renewable, and, and as you had mentioned, as a part of sort of your origin story, there were so many people who were interested in kind of setting up mining operations in Iceland, even before this crazy adoption cycle that we've seen today, which I think is rightfully kind of, we've, we've rightly found, rightfully found our place in adoption today. Um, were the, were the people who are seeking, um, mining operations in Iceland in, in the past, um, is that type, were those type of customers seeking it for different reasons as cu- the customers that are seeking it today? I think, yeah, <clears throat> that's a great question. I mean, I think, um, I think that in general, yes, there is a, there is a certain shift in the type of customer. I think, so there are a lot of, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of people interested in mining. Naturally, it is an interesting industry. It's a fascinating industry. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it, 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 it's a, it's a, it's a new technology that is changing things. So, you know, from that st- standpoint alone, it's interesting, but then you can make money off it, which makes a lot more people interested in it. Um, I think, that the maturity of this industry um it's matured a lot in the past you know three four years the 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 mix was um it was more mixed you had more small or medium scale uh miners and uh, you know running their equipment a couple of hundred machines and so on and looking for space in a data center um but then in the past 
two years alone, you know, we've seen such massive growth of the industry. Um, I, I truly believe, and I've said this before in interviews, like, I believe what we're seeing right now is the birth of the, you know, Rio Tinto, uh, Century Aluminium type companies within our, you know, uh, mining of digital assets uh, industry. So, you know, you have these big players like um, uh, Pit Farms and, you know, Foundry have stepped in and, uh, and uh, you know, there, there are lots of, of, of big players, Had8 and so on, that are uh, already um, already uh, publicly traded and so on. And, and so I think, you know, I think looking at that from the outside can kind of... Um, uh, scare a lot of people away from thinking, you know, should I buy five machines and run them somewhere? And rightly so, because if you buy five machines and you want to buy data center hosting for them, and, you know, your operating costs are always going to be significantly higher than for someone who's running thousands of machines, perhaps in their own data center and so on. So, so, but, but this is inevitable. And the, the, the maturity of this industry is inevitable. Like, at the moment, we see some pretty crazy profit margins and so on, and 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 that's all going to level out. I mean, there is a future where this is a, an industry like most others, where you know you're maybe operating at some twenty percent profit margin, and and that's perfectly normal and acceptable. And um, we we can't really expect to see ninety percent profit margins forever. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, the, the, there's definitely a change in the type of people looking to mine, I think. And that's just in in line with the whole maturity of the industry. Like we're getting more institutionalized in every aspect. Amazing. And yeah, it's, yeah, when people sometimes hear of like the 90 to 90% profit margin, it's, it's quite, quite, you know, you raise your eyebrows and it's it sounds sometimes too good to be true, but it. It is actually true. I, I, I'd be curious as to like when people do, uh, um, is there a particular ESG focus that you've kind of seen with inbound requests to start setting up? Or is that something sort of the, um, some, some more of like the critics have been kind of pointing their fingers to of, yes, everyone needs to be ESG compliant um, because it's good, but there's obviously very, uh, many opinions on ESG. Some some people might even say that ESG is is um, like a standard that a lot of people think is unfairly levied on on cryptocurrency miners because you can have so many. There's so many nuances to like what energy efficiency is, renewable and non renewable. How you're using that energy versus kind of abiding by kind of like some would say an almost arbitrary um, standard from compliance markets and even voluntary voluntary markets. But yeah, I'd be, I'd be really interested in kind of hear, get your, getting your take on that. And I know that you do have something directly involved with the, the carbon markets as well, but yeah. Yeah. So um, yes, it's, it's a, a funny coincidence or, or non-coincidence. I mean, we, we are uh, involved in uh, uh, the carbon credits industry. Uh, we, I am the chairman of the board of the International Carbon Registry, which is a new registry. Um, but uh, I, I mean, that's that's maybe a bit aside from this. But I mean, so this is a super deep question. Uh, the I, I want to say so maybe to start off with the the I think that Iceland has always gotten a relatively higher um, um, share of ESG focused um, um, projects, if you will, uh, particularly just because, you know, when you mine in Iceland, you can be assured that you are mining on renewable energy, uh, regardless of, you know, what data center you're partnered with or what power company you're buying your power from. So, so that's one element. And, and, you know, we as an industry can't, can't ignore the ESG narrative. The ESG narrative is a, is a real one. And it certainly is a necessary one. I mean, we do need to reduce uh, pollution in the world. Uh, we need to reduce the emission of greenhouse gases. And 
so so yes to keep on that first part of the question uh, i mean throughout the years we've certainly seen a lot of interest because sometimes you'll have an institutional investor who's backing a project and their mandate is clearly we are not participating in this if it's if it's not esg if it's if it doesn't run on 100% renewable energy we're not putting money into it so you know you, you we and and we have you know just clear cut cases we've seen clear cut cases of this where you have maybe uh, a pension fund in a european country who's partnering up with a a large uh, uh, mining company um and and they're just saying listen yeah we'll put money into this but it has to be in iceland so that's the demand you know so 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 that type of client may also be willing to pay uh, a slightly higher price for power because in Iceland, you know, one thing about Iceland, we're, we're certainly not in some race to the bottom with regards to power prices either. You can find parts of the world where you can get cheaper power, but uh, it it's not going to be in the country that is, you know, has been ranked number one for the safest location of a data center in the world multiple times. You know, there's always a trade-off somewhere, and for some customers, this is a this is a big uh, this is a big uh, requirement. But um, you know, and and yes, I think it's it's a definitely an unfair demand for any industry to to say, listen, you have to be one uh, you know you have to run everything on 100% renewable energy how are you supposed to do that when there's barely any place in the world where the grid is running on 100% renewable energy it's next to impossible and an industry like this one will never reach that goal but um you know for for me, I've always kind of very much leaned towards the 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 concept of you know this is a very young industry and it it exploded very uh, quickly like it 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 grew um, um, very very rapidly into a very large uh, and global industry and there are growing pains behind that um, but I do believe uh, in a future where mining gets uh, in to some sense even further decentralized with more participation from power producers or even nation states and uh, you can just imagine you know uh, uh, most power grids have a lot of excess power during the night and you know if if you're getting fairly decentralized global participation you could be seeing an, you know, evening out of the hash rate if I'm mining, you know, if I'm running 50 megawatts only during the nighttime and then someone who's eight hours ahead of me, he's also running 100 megawatts, but only during the nighttime. You know, the optimization of power grids and the, the whole power narrative is a super complicated one. And the optimization of power grids is super complicated even here in Iceland, they're having massive problems with the power grid. You know, you can't get the power you want anywhere you want because it's hard to transport power. And that's where this concept of stranded energy comes from. So, you know, I, I really think that the ESG narrative and the ESG criticism will be a thing of the past in the next, you know, three to five years for our industry. Uh, because I think that we can and, and, and have the willingness to... Um, um, be on the greener side, be on the ESG side of the, the uh, you know, of the, 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 the power industry, really. And, you know, and you're right, you know, there are some people who are kind of hardline against, you know, it's just greenwashing and so on. But in reality, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it's something that we as a, as a global society needs to think about and need to be responsible around and you know it kind of it, you know uh, i see that sometimes the guys who are working on gas for example um you know st using stranded uh natural uh, st stranded gas in relation to oil wells and so on you know sometimes i hear them fighting this but i don't even get that because if you take the gas that is being flared and you run that through a generator 
you reduce the emissions of greenhouse gases by about 70% as opposed to flaring the gas. So running a mining operation at an oil field on gas that would have been flared is an ESG project. Like you could literally issue carbon credits for the, for the reduction in emissions that you have created. So that's not, that's not a non-ESG narrative at all. It's a good thing that we can leverage our industry to reduce flaring. And numbers have shown, I believe, the flaring in North America alone would be enough to power the entire Bitcoin network. So that's ignoring flaring in the rest of the world, you know. <laughs> wow, the that 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 does sound like an ex, like yeah, a lot. Um, which is, I think, maybe it's just a education that the rest of the 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 world needs to understand and kind of the nuances specifically there. Um, thank you so much. That was so insightful. <laughs> I I I I would love to kind of hear a little bit more about. Um, uh, as you had mentioned, right there, the the particular type of customer that does come to Iceland, um, right, sometimes are as you had mentioned, coming to for ESG reasons, and and all the all that aside, right, it's their their opinion and, and perspective, and either if they if they operate in compliance markets or they're doing this voluntarily, like the pricing, do you have you had a chance to kind of take a look at like the difference in pricing, right? So, you know, some, some regions in the world are renewable, some are not using, are using non-renewable and they can get prices down to like, you know, between three to five cents per kilowatt hour. Are, are, is it pretty um, competitive in Iceland as well? Uh, at, right. Obviously you get the added benefit and perhaps even the premium that you can enjoy from using completely renewable energy in Iceland, but Right. If is is the pricing quite similar, or is it is it is there like a hefty um, kind of added tax? But no, I mean you can you 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 can be looking at pricing in that range, maybe the upper bounds of that range. You know, uh, if you if you're buying data center hosting, I'd say you know, and that's you know, then you 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 someone else is is providing you with the facilities and everything. Um, you can probably be looking at. Depending on your scale and everything, you can probably be looking at a cost of, you know, maybe the 4.8 to 6 cent range. But that's not your power cost. That's your cost at a data center. Your power cost could obviously be lower, but the barriers of entry to coming to Iceland and actually, you know, building a data center or such are quite high. It's a complicated system. Uh, you need to talk to a lot of stakeholders. You know, you need to talk to the national company that runs the grid. Uh, you need to talk to the power producers and so on. So, and 90% of the power uh, production in Iceland is, is, you know, public companies. So it's, you know, state owned essentially. But um, yeah, so it's a complicated landscape, which is why I would say, you know, all, all, pretty much everyone who wants to operate in Iceland or has operated in Iceland in the past have always done so in partnership with a local data center company. Um, almost, yeah, I th like nobody has come here and built their own data center essentially because it's a complicated landscape and so on. But uh, yeah, I mean, that price range is something you can find in Iceland. So when, when you see that, you know, the, the premium that I'm talking about, it's not that great. It's it's tiny, and if you're if you're if you're weighing, you know, you know, if you're weighing, listen, I can save half a cent or one cent on power, but you're gonna be in a location where, listen, if you know the owner of that hosting facility that you have your equipment at uh, says the wrong thing, you know, they might not be the owner of that data center anymore, and so like political risks, uh, physical risks to your equipment and so on. When all that is counted in, um, if you make a, just make a comparison list, you really can't find a better location for, for this industry then, or, or data center industries in general than, than Iceland really. Yeah. It, I, I, it honestly seems like, um, the mining industry and the folks there are, are like 
in a very good place, both socially from the ESG narrative, as well as regulatory, regulatory wise, as you had mentioned with the type of um, dynamic that is that is has resulted from the sort of load balancing concept, um, which which I think is, you guys are are very fortunate, and I and I you know only if the rest yeah. of the world were <laughs> were like that that would be amazing. I'm I'm, I'm actually curious, and and you had mentioned this a bit with um, your flared gas using flared gas comment. Um, obviously, the world is not completely renewable. I, we wouldn't be having these sorts of ESG conversations if it if it were, but. How do you kind of see um, the sort of the rest of the world operating? Um, and maybe this is kind of like a tie into the, the stuff that you do at the, the, the ICR, the International Carbon Registry Project, but right, the whole world is not able to operate on renewable immediately, perhaps in the future, if we all go nuclear or something, but um, like, like there, there's like an ideal that we all kind of strive for, or let's say what, what I mean by we is like the, the, the cryptocurrency ecosystem. And there are a lot of really va- valiant efforts from some key opinion leaders, right? Like notably Elon Musk, who said he wants everyone to go green, right? If, if Bitcoin goes over 50% green, then he's going to, I think, start letting you purchase Tesla's with Bitcoin, but, um, yeah. right. It's, it's, it's a bit idealistic. Um, I don't think we can get there immediately, but there's this sort of what we can, what can we do now? Um, right. There's, we can switch everything to renewable. We can try we maybe not get there, but there's going to be a, a, a solid sizable chunk of the hash rate that is not able to be using sort of ESG compliant renewable energy um, however, like, let's, let's just say on the end of the spectrum of like, you know, green power being like, you know, hydro, solar, wind, uh, and geothermal, et cetera. Um, and then there's like a sizable chunk that's left. How do you kind of see the rest of the world engaging with that? Or how do you think the rest of the world should be engaging with that? Do they just like give up and like, oh, we can't use renewable. So we're screwed or, uh, obviously other, other solutions, right. Like offsetting or, or, or using something else in tandem, but. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> to, to be honest, like the, 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 I think that we don't have far to go to be over 50% renewable. I, I, you know, I honestly think we're already there because particularly because, you know, we are a buyer of last resort. Uh, we, we generally, and I mean, we as an industry mining, um, we, we generally try to seek out you know, low OPEX or low operating costs. And the lowest operating costs tend to be renewable energy. And the lowest cost of renewable energy tends to be stranded renewable energy, because that is a thing. There are locations where you may have built, you know, hydropower plants, and they're they're a bit future proof, obviously, they're, they're, you know, they can, they can, they have an output of 100 megawatts. But the grid in that area can only transport, you know, 70 megawatts. And in the coming five years, they will be able to transport those other 30 megawatts. And by that time, that's when we expect there to be a demand for that power. So you have 30 megawatts of stranded energy. Who could come there and buy the energy for however long it is for sale? It's us. Like we can literally, we're literally willing to show up and install facilities in locations where, 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 where these conditions arise. So, you know, it, that's certainly a factor of it. And, and this is why I do believe that, you know, 50% should be an easily attainable goal for us. And we probably already are there, particularly with the exodus of equipment out of China, which I think kind of uh, reduces the ambiguity around the actual power we, we use. And, and, you know, I would, for one, love for us to be able to build some sort of a framework where we can kind of certify that and and just put a stamp on how much of the grid uh, how much of the, the 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 hash rate of the world essentially is on renewable energy already um it it would be a, a slightly complicated feat but you know it can be done with regards to the parts of the industry that won't um that won't be able to go green, uh, that won't be able to go and operate on renewables yet, or, you know, for some reason, uh, I mean, so, some countries 
have their grids on a far majority of you know uh, non-renewable uh, energy and they may wish to participate in uh, the industry they may wish to mine bitcoin and and that should be okay but i think that as a whole you know we can even go down the road of regardless what you think of the esg narrative regardless of whether you know you, you can you can you can even be in in the, the 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 place where you don't believe in climate change and you don't think this is an issue you know we're doing business and and that really doesn't matter what matters is what the what the public opinion is like what what the large what the macro market is saying and this is the shift this is the focus the focus is very much on esg there is a big focus on that so we can safely uh deduce that um there is um there is a the, we have a vested interest in being as green of an industry as we can it's literally going to be good for us uh particularly if we look at the fact that you know this is our biggest point of criticism as an industry uh cryptocurrencies the 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 ESG narrative is the biggest point of it, of criticism uh that people have on us and a lot of people are just playing into that a lot of people just don't like bitcoin they don't believe in bitcoin they work for a central bank or for whatever the reason may be for them to be against bitcoin this is just an easy place to hit us on so so it's definitely in the industry's interest to you know kind of try to 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 erase that you know um force them to 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 make a a, a proper argument not just oh it uses more power than ireland like um so in terms of solutions i mean you mentioned offsetting offsetting is is an obvious uh is is an obvious uh, uh option and uh it doesn't have to be it doesn't have to be super um expensive and there are there are definitely multiple ways of of achieving it and uh i really think that if if we if we agree to and you know we're always talking about utopian ideals of everyone agreeing to do something and we never <laughs> we never all agree so but that but that's okay like this is a free market one of the beauties of bitcoin is it's very much about freedom and you know so so essentially we should be allowed to do what we want um if someone wants to go down the route of you know and kind of trying to ESG certify themselves as a data center or as a as a mining facility and so on they should be allowed to do that and if someone doesn't then then fair enough i think it is really my belief that we as a whole will gain a lot from just deleting this narrative entirely like like you said you know people that have a huge platform like Elon Musk are talking about this and are saying listen you guys need to do better so that's really what we need to do to increase adoption to 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 kind of increase faith in this whole thing because it's still super young a lot of people think that this is air it's built on nothing and so on so yeah i mean my views on that are are definitely in that in that sense and and as i mentioned i would love to be able to create some sort of um standard or certification where we can kind of just certify a certain amount of hash rate just go around and create you know some level of certification for 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 data centers just so that we can have kind of on paper listen we know for 100% sure it's a guaranteed fact that this many participants in the network are 100% renewable like that would be big because i think if we did that we would just we could just show you on that paper you know in 12 months time and say look you know we've been we've been running over 50% green since 2018 or 17 or you know whatever yeah i those are fascinating and amazing points i i think what you're touching at is like we need regardless of whether or not the criticisms are legitimate um and and maybe it's some some of it is and right in where we have to take responsibility of it but some of it may be misguided because of lack of education or understanding right if we are able to kind of as you said lead this and and face it head on 
then we can be blameless, right? We, we are actually doing what we need to do. We're taking responsibility and stewardship over, over this problem. And we can kind of show an example that we are, we are acting in good faith um, as, as well. I, um, and, 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 and I, I think, I believe even as kind of uh, like, like Elon and I think um, Michael Saylor from MicroStrategy has, has mentioned, right? This, this is a, a very efficient means of kind of storing and using excess energy when, when, when people don't need it. And so, and, right, a lot of people kind of, um, when they fixate on the spectrum of um, ESG, of, of, of non-renewable, right, there is an, a point to be made where efficiency kind of goes into that, where you can kind of complement, right? Even if I'm, even if someone is using non-renewable energy, the efficiency that is being um, produced by using that non-renewable energy as opposed to other sources is, is also doing positive and, and doing positive things, things for that. Um, I, I'd love to kind of get your, get your um, take on, uh, right. The, the offsetting, if you, if you'd like to talk about that, I, I know you like the carbon offsetting um, what that looks like. And as well as um, maybe a bit later, some of the um, concepts of uh, standardization, because I know that is a very like hot topic, and a lot of people have very um, strong opinions of that. But but yeah, first, if you could talk a little bit about right, we can go renewable, and you guys are using doing renewable, and I think it's extremely noble and and valid of you guys to also be interested in like the offsetting part, which I think the rest of the world has to really. Um, lean into, but yeah, if you can talk a little bit about ICR, um, and then, then I'd love to talk about some of the standardization stuff that you've been you've been um, hinting at. Yeah, so uh, ICR is uh, the International uh, Carbon Registry. Uh, we're at carbonregistry.com. Um, if anyone wants to take a look at that, or just find me on LinkedIn, if, if you want to have a chat about that, but, um, yeah, so it's a registry. It's not an exchange. It's essentially just what we do is we issue uh, carbon credits. So a project, we, we have a couple of projects that are live already, which are forestry projects here in Iceland, um, where, uh, one of the large, uh, companies here in Iceland that own retail stores, they own gas stations and so on. They want to essentially offset, uh, uh their own emissions, their company's emissions. I mean, they have trucks and so on and their, their petrol stations. So, um, so they bought a large piece of land. They partnered up with the Icelandic department of forestry to actually grow forests on that land. And then, uh, a project like that then can have a third party, uh, an, uh, an independent third party, which is not us, come along and, and just kind of certify it according to uh, very strict guidelines and, 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 and uh, rule sets that, uh, and methodologies that, that we operate by. Um, what, you know, how much uh, will this forest in this case for example offset like how much co2 are they going to bind um for you know whatever year and uh once they kind of have that uh, 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 certified and audited they can come to us with that audit and say listen we want to issue this many tons of co2 basically you know one credit is one ton so you know we want to issue this many credits with you guys per year for this many years. And um, it's, it's, it, it's a necessary element, like the carbon credits markets are really still developing. Um, they're quite young. We have like uh, uh, mandatory markets, which are like quotas, you know, in Europe, we have this quota system. Uh, these are voluntary credits. So these are companies that are conscious of this fact because, you know, let's face it, con consumers are, are, are very conscious of these facts and they ask about these things and more and more companies are voluntarily offsetting. So, and there is a big market with, you know, not everyone just buys land and grows forests. M more companies would rather just buy uh, the credits to offset their own emissions. And, the, the super important part of this and the reason this is not, you know, um, any level of greenwashing is, is for one, I mean, everything is 
fully audited by independent third parties. We're not just in the business of just creating credits out of thin air and all that. But secondly, the whole concept of this is to be able to finance a, a, a climate projects. So like forestry, you know, in the in the past, like who's going to invest in forestry? Sure, you know, you might be able to get some 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 returns when you sell the lumber in 20 years or whatever. But this whole industry is is pushing the growth of climate project. And and what's particularly interesting and what we certainly want to work with are carbon removal projects. And there are some super interesting things happening in the world on that scale at the moment, where people are literally capturing CO2 from the environment and binding it. In Iceland, we have one where they take CO2 and they bind it in basalt, which is a rock formation, and they literally take CO2. And we will be in a position where we can literally import CO2 and and pump it into the ground and bind it in the rock formation underneath Iceland. So, you know, uh, and that opens, obviously, that whole thing opens up the possibility of these projects to go into uh, uh, lenders and banks and, and, and get financing for their projects, uh, what do you call it, with, with the future credits as collateral, for example, um, which is certainly uh, uh, necessary for the growth of this industry as a whole. That's so, so fascinating. I, I think it, it really touches and hits home on one of my favorite kind of concepts of even how like the Bitcoin consensus mechanism works, right? Good behavior has to be incentivized. Good behavior cannot rely on altruism. And I think, right, with these, as you had mentioned, right, not only do people uh, get the get the, the 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 benefits of you know you know sequestering carbon, but it's incentivized because people are, are purchasing it, and you you obviously make a profit on it. And as you had pointed out, you are really kind of honing in on supporting these these industries. Um, these carbon, these carbon projects and sequestration projects, uh, and, yeah. and more. I I would love to kind of get your take on um, uh, and uh, standardization and also kind of fungibility. So, and and what I mean by that is there's a lot of um, people um, who are kind of looking at standardization from ESG uh, as kind of very restrictive and some would say even almost arbitrary set of guidelines that people have of this is what is ESG compliant, this is not what is ESG compliant. And that goes deeply into the nuances of what I briefly mentioned, right? And, and that kind of goes into, right, there are many carbon registries that that exist. There's like the VCS, et, et cetera, um, and with like the different standards, like the red standard um, of what type of um, carbon sequestration does kind of feed into these type of registries. And, right, and, and I know the carbon debate the, the carbon credits debate is is as old as time, right? Where some people are saying this is legitimate, something some people are saying this is not legitimate. How do you see like ICR kind of fitting into that? And I'm I'm assuming you got you guys have had your fair share of conversations with other registries, um, and as well as like the support of your projects um, seeking that, as you had mentioned, independent third parties. Yeah. So I mean, essentially, the, the the our registry was born in Iceland uh, out of the need for such a registry in Iceland, but it very quickly became apparent that there's still a need for more players in this space globally, and that's how we became the International Carbon Registry, not just the Icelandic Carbon Registry or whatever. Um, so I mean, standardization in this is hugely important, and there is a pretty level playing field. I mean, particularly in, in, in over here in Europe, you know, we have types of credits based on uh, a methodology called CDM, um, which was born uh, under the um, Tokyo Climate uh, Agreement. And, um, and um, so, you know, there, there, there's sort of like a, a fairly level playing field. And... Uh, it doesn't look like anyone is really playing outside of, of that. And, and you can't. I mean, it is a global market. There are lots of different exchanges. There, there, uh, there's, a fairly, there's a very large OTC market with uh, carbon credits. So, you know, we need to be on a level playing field. We need to be good actors 
and it would only devalue our own project if we, for example, were on some level cutting corners or going, hey, listen, register with us and, you know, you can do it quicker or, you know, we'll just skip checking this part. Like that's, that's never going to work. There are, uh, there are nuances. And, and, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it's a fairly underdeveloped uh, industry, the, the carbon credits industry and the issuances of, of credits and so on. Um, we have some, yeah, we have some nonprofits in the space, uh, Gold Standard and Vera, for example, um, and 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 apparently, like sometimes their their focus can be can be not 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 purely on you know helping these projects uh, issue their carbon credits, but their kind of uh, standard set of requirements may have some elements to it which which can be great which are for example you know you need to check the box of being in an underdeveloped uh, uh, geographical region um, so so you know they're really trying to 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 push the growth of these types of projects within specific geographical regions and so on which doesn't necessarily benefit uh, everyone in the industry, you know, we, for example, have some, some, uh, uh, we're having some big conversations with, with, uh, companies, uh, that are over in, in, in Asia, for example, where they cannot issue on these platforms anymore because they don't count as being an underdeveloped geographical region. Uh, so you have massive solar projects that are definitely going to reduce emissions because, they're shifting from from carbon fuels to to uh, to uh, renewables, but uh, they all of a sudden no longer have a platform to issue their credits on. And for us uh, in particular, we we certainly want to work with um, um, new tech startups um, because the path to market can be quite complicated for them. Because if you have new technology, nobody has verified it before. You literally need to work. To put a lot of work into actually creating the rule set and the methodology for issuing those credits, so that can be a complicated process, and it's certainly something that we want to 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 assist with. And our you know founder and CEO is has actually been doing that for a, a while. That's that's how he comes into the the whole carbon credits market. Is he's been uh, helping out with. Uh, 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 creating rule sets for new tech and for the Icelandic industry and so on. So uh, that's kind of that's kind of how he segued into this. Um, but I mean, standardization and everybody playing on the same uh, uh, on a level playing field is obviously super super important for an industry like this one because um, if 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 at some point we are like I mentioned earlier, if, so, if at some point any of the players of this industry are cutting corners, it's bad for the industry as a whole. So I think that, you know, if you're talking to someone who's at any level, you know, reputable and serious about this industry, that shouldn't be a problem you're going to face. But, you know, uh, I think it can be expected as with any new industry, we, we might see some cowboys, but uh, that's definitely not our approach to this. Amazing. I, 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 I'm so glad that we were, we were able to have this conversation and kind of get a, do a deeper dive into what you guys are doing, especially with you guys, right. Being a, a, at the perfect kind of like trifecta of our being in Iceland, having renewable energy, being part of the mining industry, and also as part of the mining industry facing and, and dealing with these sorts of carbon credit issuance platforms and registries and, um, together at the same time. And I, and I really do believe that, as you had said, right, the cryptocurrency industry, especially the proof of work mining industry, does need to kind of have the responsibility of tackling these issues head on and leading the narrative there. And I, I really do think you guys are basically leading, right, breaking new ground and, and kind of showing the world like how it can be done. I'm very excited to kind of see what you guys are going to be continuing to do in the future. And I, I, I definitely know that you guys are going to have a big impact on, on, on at the global scale. Um, is there anything that you kind of like would like to say um, or maybe have people kind of check out if they're interested, especially, right? There's, you guys have like the mining industry. If people are interested in getting access to, to Iceland and working with you guys, as well as like the, the, the offset industry or the registry industry, um, 
or, or just send people to like the relevant like links that you guys have. Um, yeah, just close yeah. thoughts. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, first off, thank you for, for the conversation. Uh, definitely uh, always fun to, to, to talk about these things. And as you said, you know, we could sit here for hours and hours and, and talk about this. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, Green Blocks is definitely looking for partners, uh, both, you know, power producers and those interested in, in getting involved in, in mining. Um, ICR is also looking for partners, but, you know, I, I think that's a bit further outside. Maybe we only went live, uh, middle of August. So it's, it's very, very new. We're already talking to people pretty much in all corners of the globe. Uh, as I said, there is a need for this. Um, and, and, uh, we definitely want to, as you just mentioned, we, we want to be a key player in this and, uh, and, uh, help, uh, grow these, these two industries. And there is a synergy between the two. Uh, it's probably best to just find me, find, I'm Daniel Johnson on LinkedIn. I'm DF Johnson, J-O-N-S-S-O-N on, on Twitter. Um, just, uh, seek me out if you have thoughts or comments or want to engage in any way. Awesome. Thank you so much again for your time. I know we went a bit over, but um, yeah, looking forward to continuing. Really happy to have you as part of like the FTPool family. And as you know, we, we've been doing a lot of stuff, um, investigating systems to des- and designing systems to do carbon offset um, and figuring out how to like use like registries like like yours or carbon, carbon credit um, registries. And um, yeah, yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Johnson, Daniel Johnson. And I will um, follow up later. Great. Thank you, Daniel. Bye-bye.